Ah, yes, the smudges. I like this photograph, actually. Um, and if you lay it on the floor like this, the Fletcher Pratt game, to have a go at trying to get your... Do you have a go? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, actually, Tom was very keen, wasn't he? You know, he was you know, down there, wasn't he? Tom was upside down, vertical, um, to make sure he got it accurately. Uh, but this is a stage photograph, because they didn't fire from there, they actually fired from the bow of the ship. Uh, not the actual position of the guns. That's the stern. Yeah. Oh. oh, yes, it is the stern. <laughs> yes. Sorry, nautical phrase. A bit past, yeah. Yes. So it is a stage photograph, actually. So it's it there. Um, yes, jump merit. Right, next one, please. Right. Now, why did the game decline in 1946? Now, later commentators said the players were tired of real war, and that sounds very plausible, doesn't it? Um, or is it? Well, the actual reasons, because I've got some of the correspondence. The New York ball Ballroom became a ballroom on Friday nights again due to the demand for huge numbers of returning ex-servicemen and women want to meet other ex-servicemen and women. That's what they wanted to do. So the ballroom returned to being a ballroom. Uh, there were various revivals of the game, uh, 1965, Dan Dorsey in the United States, 1970s, etc. But it never had the prominence of those New York games. When they had 60 plus players aside, an umpiring team of 15, and hundreds of spectators. Obviously, they had a bar, San Sophia War Game with a bar. Um, you had children running around. Obviously, they had gambling involved. And it became part of the social scene of New York, uh, the New York game. Next one, please. The other explanation for why the game declined is much more mundane. Was there something about the game which bred success, or was it just successful people played the game? Maybe there's a little bit of both. Well, who else played the game? Well, Isaac Asimov, Rob Hubbard, Sprague the Camp went on to write. Um, these are the only the authors I recognise. There are other obscure American authors, but I'm not really into obscure American authors, so I need to go for the big names. Uh, Doc Clark went on to work at National Importance on Rocky Fuel. Trevor Dupuy, remember him? Well, he played in the game. And what's very interesting uh, was he developed something called the Quantitative Judgment Model of Combat. And when you look at the Fletcher Pratt equation for ship damage, and then you look at the Quantitative Judgment Model, you start to see, well, what was the inspiration? Well, probably it was the Fletcher Pratt game. Uh, it was very interesting, I was talking to Peter Perler in Bath yesterday and he said Harpoon, so Larry Bond's inspiration for Harpoon and all those equations in Harpoon was the Fletcher Pratt naval war game because he talked to people who played in that game. Uh, Jerry Sinkram, well he became an admiral in World War II. Uh, not bad, is it from commanding the toy ships, the real ones? Uh, oh, by the way, his achievement in World War II was actually getting the Brazilian Navy to get to sea. Apparently no one else has ever done so, but he did. Uh, he also had to salute himself because he was made an admiral in the Brazilian Navy as well as the American Navy. It must be very confusing diplomatic functions. Uh, some of the other people, like John Podwell, he went to become a naval officer with a career of 30 years. Um, I quite like John Podwell's career. His mother wrote to the President of the United States to say, my son's playing the Fletcher Pratt Mobile War Game, he's very interested, can he join up? So obviously the President of the United States wrote back and said, please do give this letter to the recruiting sergeant, whatever they call him, the fleet. So he went along to the recruitment office when he was 16 on his 16th birthday, and he was inducted in the United States Navy in apparently 30 seconds. As you can imagine, you, you, you know, who is this guy with a letter from the President of the United States, a recommendation letter, oh my gosh. <laughs> so within hours he was off to go and join the war in 1943 on his 16th birthday. Uh, Jack Coggins, a go author and artist. There was a Broadway actress. Now I don't know who she was because they, none of the correspondents met, mentioned her by name. Um, we wouldn't have that, would we? War games where people aren't mentioned by real names for whatever reason. No, no, no. It was in black games or whatever. But she had glamour to the games, uh, most certainly. Uh, she's well, well known, and she obviously turned up with her crowd of associate people also working on Broadway. Uh, she went on to a post-war Hollywood career. 
So despite extensive work by Wayne Thomas, uh, we couldn't identify who she was. There was also a su successful beef magnet who went on to whatever successful beef magnets do. I've got no idea, supply McDonald's or whatever. But anyway, they said it didn't have his name in there, but they just referred to him like that. But he, you know, he left the New York area and went on to become really rich and a multi-millionaire. So, I think probably the most likely explanation is the key people finished the war was over, huge opportunities in post-war America, they simply had more interesting things to do than meet on a Friday night and run huge naval war games. Very strange, <laughs> can't see it myself. <laughs> okay, next one please. Part two, the Fletcher Pratt naval war game as a model of big gun naval warfare. You're welcome to interrupt and challenge at any point. Not that I need to say that, because you lot always do. Uh, <clears throat> now, I looked at this and I thought, well, it's a game. And then I started to realise, well, actually, it's a bit more than just a game. It is a simulation. And this is my view. Okay, next one, please. Now, this is Fletcher Pratt's Scratchfield Navy. It's now at the Naval War College. Um, and it's just like 2,000 ships in there. This is only a small part of it. How did someone manage to build 2,000 scratch build ships and do anything else in their life? Um, but clearly he did. Uh, so anyway, I've got an old photograph of theirs. Uh, because apparently it's, it's away in a shoebox or something. And so I couldn't get a new photograph. But I will one day. I think it must be you know, a, a crate labelled. But anyway, they were quite impressed by the fact. Uh, and when I asked them, they did ask, how did I know they had it? Ah, how did you know? Ah, as if you know some secret I've revealed. But anyway, I'm sure I'll get a new photograph in due course. Next one, please. Now, the Pratt rules have been condemned, and it's Shane Phil Barker isn't here, actually. Uh, he credits the use of the rules by the United States Navy for the initial defeats by the Japanese. He said the weakness of the rules was the focus on long-range gunnery duels was wrong, the wrong strategy, uh, the correct strategy is to get in there and stuff the opponent using the massive rate of fire of your guns at the shortest possible range so you can't miss the other side. They said the rules were okay for Jutland in good visibility, but they were clearly just not rules for the 1920s, 1930s, World War II. And he's quite strong in his views on that, if you can imagine that. Surely not. Surely not, <laughs> yes. But you have to respect the fact that Phil has had a lifetime war game in military history and in his casual views, are of importance. Okay, next one, please. Uh, now, this is the American War College game. Now, the American War College, they actually use the Pratt rules, but they also use their own. Now, very much it's a poor quality photograph, so I asked Peter Puller, and he hasn't got any better ones. <coughs> so they used a checkerboard, admirals, umpires, turning circles, little ships. How did the game? Well, the game was similar in some ways and different in other ways. Next one, please. But let's carry on condemning them first, and I'll talk about the similarities. Uh, Jim Dunningham, James Dunningham, SBI, etc. Well, he roundly condemned them in 1967. He said the formula for ship strength didn't take account for variation in damage control. For example, the Germans in World War I were superior to the Royal Navy in damage control. At least. That's James Dunning's view. There was a, there's also a theory that the Germans could build their ships differently. So the compartment system was... Yes. Sir. Because they didn't have the same requirements the British had to be on the station for long periods yeah. of time. Yeah, they were basically, basically the Germans, Germans, weren't they? Germans didn't sleep on the ship. Yeah. The Germans slept ashore. So in terms of compartmentalisation, they could base it entirely on protection, not mm. on, on livability. Yes. There's also things like the armour in World War I. They placed it, they concentrated the armour with which ships was more even. Mm -hmm. Distribution of armour belts. Anyway, you also cr criticise mm -hmm. the lack of critical hits, for example, the Royal Navy ships at Jutland. Clearly, there was a problem with procedures. There was a, clearly a problem with the technology and training at the time. Fire control. Well, he said, Germans fired all their guns very rangy. The Royal Navy fired one turret on, on target and then all the guns fired. So it's the Fletcher Pratt S range range is rubbish. He said there's no stupid game, no hidden aspects of the game. So he roundly condemned it and has done once or twice since. Please. Now, but this is contradicted by the practice of the time. 
So Prior had access to the Naval War College's games, and they had access to his. So you've got this Naval War Correspondent who walks into their top secret training games, their top secret planning games, and they are then walking along on a Friday night to see Fletcher Pratt's ballroom games. What's going on? An example is Admiral Ingram, who was commandant of the New York shipyard at the time, and then was the commander of the United States uh, Navy in the South Atlantic. He brought a team of inside ensigns to game. They played versus Dizzy Dames. They were fashion artists. And of course, fashion artists were formidable opponents because part of their job was estimating things in inches. Oh, you need 16 yards of cloth to do that. Oh, that's 34 inch hem or whatever. They, you know, they just look and know. Anyway, so the United States Navy team was being hammered, which apparently was not a good thing. Surely not. But anyway, it was a brilliant torpedo attack uh, brought victory to the United States team. So the Admiral clearly knew how to use destroyers, and he also clearly knew how to use torpedoes. And rather than just the, the modern naval war game, which is you send your destroyers out preferably in ones, and you sort of get close to the enemy and you try and shoot them in line, you don't, you should use a spread. You should do it mathematically, so you shoot from different directions. You should coordinate your attacks so all your torpedoes are arriving on the same target at the same time from different directions. And on the floor, it does take a bit of coordination actually to do this. Uh, once you've worked out it, you're a really formidable opponent. But anyway, that's what happened. So fortunately, Fletcher Pratt was away at the time, but Inga, who was umpiring the games, woman, well, no, she was hostess of the games, and um, the hostess was in charge of the umpires and anything else. Fortunately, she was very pleased, she wrote, that you know, the Admiral then won. Um, but can you imagine a modern war game? You've got a senior military figure turning up with his staff to play your game? You know, if your game is rubbish, it's not a representation of warfare, you just can't see it. I mean, can we imagine, you know, I don't know, the commandant of uh, Sandhurst turning up with a team of people saying, right, I don't want to play Mega Blitz, right, let's... Um, I'm open to offers. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Anybody has influence. Oh, I think Mega Blitz is a good model, by the way. But it's just, which is, yeah, it's I quite just... Like idea, I quite like the idea of a game with a host at Yeah, yes, yes. Did you do games? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, actually, they had it sus socially. They really did. Um, it's interesting to see the number of marriages were reported in the War Games Whale, which was the journal of the Fletcher Pratt Naval War Game at the time, actually. You know, every week it was so-and-so got engaged, so-and-so got married, so-and-so's going out with so-and-so. It's like a little dating section. And that's the thing that comes over with us. This is New York society. It's, yeah, it's about New York This is literary society. society. Um, yes. Um, yeah, literary, intellectual yeah. society, so a certain... Yes. Should we go to the Algonquin Round Table, or should we go and play the Fletcher Pratt Naval War Game? Yes. Um, um, yeah, they, they had it sus socially, I can tell you. I mean, I'd never go to a War Game conference, which didn't have a bar, for example. <laughs> okay, next one, please. Um, 